Sup chooms, how y'all living? So whether or not you are new to the good fight against hair loss, or you're a veteran, then chances are you've heard of minoxidil. Minoxidil is a growth stimulant, meaning it promotes hair growth through mechanisms unrelated to androgens. Because of this, minoxidil is not typically seen as being a very effective standalone treatment for fighting androgenic alopecia, because even if you are promoting hair growth with minoxidil, you're still going to have dihydrotestosterone, DHT, destroying the hair follicle, so even if you can get some growth in the short term with minoxidil, chances are you're probably going to need something to deal with the androgens on the scalp eventually, like finasteride or dutasteride. So even though minoxidil is not an effective standalone treatment, it is an outstanding adjunct treatment when used alongside a 5A reductase inhibitor like finasteride, since by combining minoxidil and finasteride together, you're going to be fighting hair loss on two different fronts. With finasteride, you'll be lowering DHT levels on the scalp, which of course is a good thing since DHT is the trash hormone that causes hair loss in men with androgenic alopecia. And with minoxidil, you'll be promoting hair growth, and since you're lowering androgens on the scalp, this will allow the minoxidil to work more effectively since it can grow hair with less interference from the DHT that is trying to miniaturize the hair follicles on your scalp. That is why from minoxidil plus finasteride, this stack has long been considered the gold standard for fighting hair loss, as it will work in well over 90% of people, and even just finasteride alone will often be good enough for most people fighting androgenic alopecia, especially if they start treatment before they've lost ground, which they absolutely should. So, how does minoxidil work? Honestly, who cares? There are several interesting theories, but we don't know for sure. But what is important is not causation, but outcome. And in that regard, we know that minoxidil is clinically proven to be both safe and effective. And really, that's all that matters. Let the pencil neck, egg headed neck beards dick around with theory all they want. All I care about is the bottom line. But with that said, why is minoxidil only available commercially in a 2 or 5% solution? If minoxidil is so great and effective, then how come the FDA hasn't made stronger concentrations available. There are stronger variations of minoxidil available overseas on the gray market like 10 and 15% minoxidil, but how come these are difficult to source and not easily accessible as 5% minoxidil, for instance? I mean, if 10 and 15% minoxidil work better and is still safe, then surely drug manufacturers would work for FDA approval to get it available for consumers, especially since brand name 5% Rogaine has now has to compete with all the equivalent generics on the market, so surely it'd be more profitable for them to have something that they they can sell and at least for a good while um, not have to worry about generics since the patent would take a while to expire. But keep in mind, Rogaine was first made available in 1988 as a 2% solution and was later made available as a 5% solution in 1997. Well, it's been 25 years, so how come we don't yet have a 10 or 15% solution available over the counter or even available by prescription like in most countries in the USA? Well, to answer this, we have to first examine the research available on stronger concentrations of minoxidil to find out whether or not more is necessarily better. So come join me, my friends, and let's dive balls deep into this quest for knowledge so we can discover whether or not investing in stronger minoxidil concentrations is worth your time and money. So fortunately, we don't have to just speculate here. It turns out we have some hard data we can look at on both 10 and 15% minoxidil solutions, including data comparing stronger solutions of minoxidil directly to 5% minoxidil. So let's start with the 10% solution first, as I don't think I've ever seen a minoxidil minoxidil solution between 5 and 10%, so 10% is the next available concentration of minoxidil available to consumers, at least as far as I know. So, good news. There is a recent study looking at 10% minoxidil. It was published in 2019, and it is called, quote, Efficacy and Safety of a New 10% Topical Minoxidil versus 5% Topical Minoxidil and Placebo in the Treatment of Male Androgenetic Alopecia, a Trechoscopic Evaluation. And it's from Egypt, the land of the bald pharaohs, since it seems like a lot of these studies on bald people come from Egypt, interestingly enough. So the paper goes over some theoretical mechanisms behind minoxidil, which again, I don't think is important because theory doesn't matter to consumers, outcome does. And like I said earlier, there are several proposed theories, so take what you hear about minoxidil minoxidil's mechanism with a grain of salt because, you know, it really it could be anything or a combination of multiple factors. So instead, let's focus on the methodology of the study. The study involved 90 male patients with androgenic alopecia with various levels of severity. The patients were divided into three groups. One group got 5% minoxidil, one group got 10% minoxidil, and one group got placebo solution, which is nothing, of course, and they applied the solutions at one milliliter twice daily, which is the FDA-recommended dosage for topical minoxidil, both 5 and 2%. 
The study went on for 36 weeks and it was a randomized double-blinded placebo controlled trial, which is the best type of study you can have since you have a control group to compare the results of the treatment group to so you can know with a fair degree of certainty that the results you see from the study are not just due to chance. Also, the sample size at 90 subjects is pretty decent. The patients were evaluated every four weeks and the tests they utilized were hair pull tests, which is not generally considered a very good means of testing hair count since even healthy hairs can be pulled out, especially if they're in the intelligent resting phase, but they also use photographs and a trichoscopy, and trichoscopy, I should say, the latter of which is considered a good form of measuring progress since you can zoom in really close on the scalp and then count the individual hairs. So in this case, they measured hairs in one square centimeter and classified them as terminal thick hairs, intermediate hairs, and miniaturized hairs, also known as vellus hairs. They also measured patient satisfaction scores, which I don't think really matters because oftentimes individuals will not have a very good understanding of how these treatments are supposed to work, which is why you hear so many people freak out about a treatment and assume it is not working even when they've only been on it for a couple of months. So fortunately, clinical progress was also assessed by photographs that were reviewed by dermatologists, which is a little bit more objective in my opinion. The safety of the treatments were, was also assessed as well using metrics like scalp irritation, the amount of shedding at the start of treatment, hypertrichosis, which means too much hair growth, which I think they mean on other parts of the body and not the scalp, as obviously it is hard to imagine getting too much hair growth on the scalp. They also measured blood pressure and pulse, which is appropriate because minoxidil is a blood pressure medication and possibly using higher concentrations might result in more systemic absorption, which of course is not a good thing when you consider the fact that minoxidil is a last resort treatment for patients who are dying from cardiovascular disease because of its risk of severe side effects when taken orally. Finally, they also looked at sexual function, which I wouldn't have expected being that minoxidil isn't linked to any sexual side effects, but I guess they did it anyways, maybe to satisfy some of the crazy lab rats on the hair loss forums that think that all treatment for hair loss causes irreversible reversible sexual dysfunction, or so they claim. So what were the results of this Egyptian study when translated from Coptic into English? Well, Looking at the characteristic of the patients, the average age was 29 years old, which seems pretty young, indicating that the severity of hair loss from your average patient was high, and as it turns out, it was pretty severe because most of the patients were at least a Norwood 3 to a Norwood 5, and there were even some patients who were Norwood 6 or Norwood 7. So they probably all had hair loss due to some Egyptian curse, so anyone traveling to Egypt should be sure not to disturb any Egyptian tombs or vampires lurking in any dark mansions. So anyways, the average duration of hair loss for the subjects was at least six years, and 70 to 80% had a family history of hair loss, which is important to remember, since even though family history of hair loss is a predictor of hair loss, it is no guarantee one way or the other. You can very well not have any family history of hair loss and still get the slap head curse, so better start treatment now before it's too late and you need a hair transplant like I did. So anyways, on that note, it's important to point out that none of these patients were on any existing treatments for six months prior to the start of the study. So no finasteride, no detachment, and no blood flow band. So minoxidil is doing the heavy lifting here, which is fine because like I said, minoxidil can work as a standalone treatment in the short term and that's all we need for this study. So out of the 90 patients enrolled, only 63 patients finished the trial, and most of these were from the placebo group, which makes sense since if you were on the treatment that wasn't doing anything, chances are you wouldn't feel motivated to complete it. So looking at the trichoscopy results, which we can see here in this table, 5% minoxidil surprisingly was better than 10% minoxidil in every single category. No exceptions. Now, not all the differences were statistically significant, but we can say for sure that 10% minoxidil was not not better than 5% minoxidil, so maybe that gives us a better understanding of why there hasn't been a big push to make stronger concentrations of minoxidil beyond 5% more readily available to consumers. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen an example of more being less with a hair loss treatment. If you remember my video on SM04554, for instance, it was the same thing where higher concentrations of, of SM04554 were worse than lower concentrations, so this isn't unique to just minoxidil. More is not always better. Both concentrations of minoxidil were better than placebo, so at the very worst, 10% minoxidil is still better than doing nothing, but it does seem redundant if it can't show any improvement beyond 5% minoxidil, which will also likely have less systemic absorption and thus a lower risk of side effects. So looking at some of the more subjective results of the study, we have the pull test, the global photo assessment, and the patient satisfaction questionnaire, and these all showed similar results between 5% and 10% minoxidil, and both concentrations were better than placebo. 
placebo, although yet again, looking at the more objective data from the trichoscopy, it was the 5% minoxidil that came out on top, besting 10% minoxidil. So we know so far that 10% minoxidil is pretty underwhelming as far as efficacy goes, but in case that isn't enough to dissuade you from taking it, let's take a look at the safety profile of the two concentrations when compared to each other. So it turns out contact dermatitis, which is inflammation of the scalp, occurred in a whopping 100% of all patients who are on 10% minoxidil versus only 22% of patients who were on 5%. This makes sense, especially considering the number of people who claim 5% minoxidil gave them dermatitis and they resolved it by either lowering their dosage or by switching to 2% minoxidil. But beyond that, there were also scalp erosions, which is basically when the skin melts or sloughs off, as you can see in this picture here, which is really go gross. But the incidence of scalp erosion was more than twice as high on 10% minoxidil versus 5% minoxidil. So it looks like with 10% minoxidil, you get double the trouble, but not double the fun. So screw that. I'll just go ahead and stick with 5%. Furthermore, the patients on 10% reported greater incidence of headaches and also hair shedding at the beginning of treatment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing since any shedding you get from hair loss treatment will grow back. But nevertheless, it's not a pleasant experience. And it's a very common reason why people do not stick with treatment, which is stupid because if you're so scared of shedding from a hair loss treatment, then imagine how you're going to feel when you shed from androgenic alopecia. Fortunately, but not surprisingly, there were no sexual side effects. And also there were no side effects related to vital signs, which means that hopefully there are no cardiovascular side effects from using a higher concentration of minoxidil. So anyways, the authors conclude their study by saying that 10% minoxidil is not superior to 5% minoxidil and actually causes more side effects. They recommended that people stick with 5% minoxidil, though they also interestingly enough speculate that if you're on a non, that if you're a non-responder to 5% minoxidil, then perhaps 10% minoxidil might be an alternative, although they didn't have any data to support this speculation. The theory behind this is that some people lack or have very low levels of the enzyme sulfotransferase, which is what converts minoxidil into its active form, minoxidil sulfate. So for some people, applying minoxidil may not be very effective just because they don't have sufficient quantities of this enzyme. But perhaps for those few people, a higher concentration of minoxidil might make up for this deficiency. It should be important to note, though, that a lot of people confuse a lack of regrowth as a sign a treatment isn't working. So they'll stop, stop treatment and then lose ground. So just remember to temper your expectations to give any treatment you start at least a year before you judge whether or not something is working. If minoxidil doesn't work for you, you can stop it and not lose any ground, so don't worry about it. Your hair doesn't become addicted to minoxidil like some people claim. Rather, it's just that any benefits you experience on minoxidil will likely be dependent on continuing minoxidil in order to maintain the results. So anyways, this sulfotransferase ties into the next paper, which is actually a study on 15% minoxidil. So this one was published a little bit earlier in 2016, and it is titled, quote, Minoxidil Dose Response Study in Female Pattern Hair Loss Patients Determined to be Non-Responders to 5% Topical Minoxidil, unquote. So this time, this study is from Italy, and unfortunately, all we have is a summary of the study because for some reason, the full study was never published online. In fact, this looks like it's just a letter and not even a full study. In fact, if you look at the website, clinicaltrials.gov, it looks like this study was withdrawn for some reason, which could mean anything, but probably isn't a good sign. So in any case, this was a study done on women with female pattern hair loss, which is just another type of androgenic alopecia, and it can affect men as well, such as men who have diffuse thinning. And they note that 5% minoxidil is only effective in 40% of women, according to their statistics, which seems awfully low, especially considering how many women report great success with even 2% minoxidil, but it's in Italy, so who knows. So like we said, non-responders non are believed to lack the sulfotransferase enzyme, so in this study, they looked at using a higher concentration of minoxidil, namely 15%, to see if it would work on these non-responders to 5% minoxidil. So these non-responding women were treated with 15% minoxidil for 12 weeks, and 60% of them responded to 15% minoxidil, where they hadn't responded at all to 5%. They had hair counts improved by 13.7% over baseline, and had improvements in photographic assessments as well. There were no adverse effects and no changes in blood pressure, which is quite a contrast to the last study where 100% of the men on 10% minoxidil had contact dermatitis. So this seems pretty interesting. Here's the problem though. Since the study was never
never published, we don't have any other details. In fact, we don't even know how many women were treated. So as far as we know, this could have just been barely more than a case study. I mean, it could have had a number of subjects in the single digits for as far as we know. So looking at the study with women on 15% minoxidil, and then looking at the study with men on 10% minoxidil, it seems that higher concentrations of minoxidil may only be effective in people when they don't respond to 5% minoxidil. So if you respond well to 5% minoxidil, don't get hair greed and think you'll get better results by upgrading to 10 or 15% minoxidil. The evidence shows the opposite will actually happen. But if you are one of the few people who really do get no results from 5% minoxidil and don't just imagine you get no results, then maybe it is worth a try, though granted we don't have a whole lot of data about the safety or efficacy of the treatment long term. There are other growth stimulants out there like tamoxetine, although that isn't even as effective as 2% minoxidil. But fortunately, if you aren't a responder to 5% minoxidil, Minoxidil, you may not have to risk a 10 or 15% minoxidil solution from some shady gray market website. There is evidence that some people with low sulfotransferase enzyme activity on the scalp can increase the sulfotransferase enzyme by combining 5% minoxidil with 0.1% tretinoin. In fact, in a study which I'll link below, it was found that 43% of non responders to minoxidil were turned into responders by just mixing in 0.1% tretinoin. I used to do this myself and I didn't personally personally notice any benefit beyond just regular 5% minoxidil, but I am a good responder to minoxidil, keep in mind, so it probably doesn't matter in my case. So mixing tretinoin with minoxidil won't make a difference if you are a responder to minoxidil most likely, but if you're not a responder to 5% minoxidil, it may actually help to mix in 0.1% uh, tretinoin according to the research published on it. So. So to sum up everything we've gone over, 5% minoxidil works well on the majority of people, and for responders to 5% minoxidil, using stronger concentrations seems to make things no better or possibly even worse. For non-responders, it is possible stronger concentrations work better, but keep in mind, this is based on a study involving women where we don't even know the sample size. Additionally, a lot of these stronger concentrations of minoxidil come from really shady looking websites where we don't even know if they're selling legitimate stronger concentrations of minoxidil. I mean, we know that in the USA, at least, it is not legal to sell concentration of minoxidil stronger than 5% to consumers, and in other parts of the world, you need a prescription. So either these manufacturers are lying about the concentrations or they're breaking the law. Either way, I wouldn't count on these suppliers to be around forever, so I'd rather just stick to using uh, legitimate treatments, which means 5% minoxidil for most of us, or 5% minoxidil mixed with 0.1% tretinoin for the few when 5% minoxidil isn't enough. So I think that's about all there is to to say about stronger minoxidil concentrations, so I'm going to get back to harassing Elon Musk about the Cybertruck's release date. Take care.